On November 22, 1963, all of Dallas, Texas was abuzz over the visit of President John F. Kennedy and his wife Jackie. Throngs of people crowded along the roads as his motorcade snaked its way through the city. A Dallas dress manufacturer named Abraham Zapruder stood in a small crowd with his home movie camera waiting for the President of the United States to pass by. As Kennedy's motorcade turned the corner into Dealey Plaza, Zapruder put his eye to the viewfinder and began filming. This unassuming man, using an ordinary camera, captured a seminal moment in the history of America. Indeed, in the entire history of the 20th century. In March of 1997, at the National Archives II in College Park, Maryland, a replication of this moment in history began. For five days, photographers painstakingly reshot the film frame by frame from Zapruder's camera original to 4x5 transparencies. This reproduction is the first time a copy of the film has been made from the original since the day of Kennedy's assassination. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Parkland Hospital, there has been a shooting. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. On the morning of November 22, 1963, Abraham Zapruder went to his place of business, Jennifer Juniors of Dallas, quartered in the Daltex building. The building stands on the northeast side of Dealey Plaza, directly across the street from the Texas School Book Depository. Kennedy's motorcade would pass by the building and through Dealey Plaza on its way to a luncheon at the Dallas Trademark. Zapruder owned a Bell & Howell Model 414 PD home movie camera that was considered double eight millimeter format. The original eight millimeter technology uh, is called double eight. And what it really amounts to is a, uh, an amateur's camera is designed to take a roll of film, a spool of film, that's 25 to 30 or 33 feet in length uh, and is 16 millimeters wide. Uh, the camera person would load the film in the camera, uh, expose those first 25 feet but they'd only expose one edge of it, one eight millimeter width down that 16 millimeter piece of film. Uh, after exposing the first run of it, the uh, spool, which is the film which is now on the take-up spool, uh, is reversed, put up on the supply side, the empty spool then goes on the bottom, the camera is rethreaded, and the other side is then exposed. Uh, the film then would go to a processor who would process it, develop it or print it, uh, whatever is appropriate, uh, on uh, equipment that's designed for 16 millimeter wide film. 16 millimeter is a standard audiovisual medium. Uh, ultimately, then the film is split into two 8 millimeter widths. The two 8 millimeter pieces are then spliced end to end. And what started out life as a 33 foot piece of 16 millimeter wide film ends up as something like 50 or 60 or 66 feet of 8 millimeter wide film. On the morning of November 22nd, Zapruder decided not to take the camera with him to work. Marilyn Sitzman, one of his assistants, recalls what happened. He didn't bring his camera. So his assistant, Lillian, and I persuaded him to go get his camera, that he needed to take these pictures for his grandsons and for his children and etc. And we knew he really wanted to take the pictures anyway. Zapruder accompanied a group of workers from the dress factory to Dealey Plaza to watch as the Kennedys passed. And we're talking about, well, where can he stand? Because by this time, there's quite a few people gathering. And we'd go look at this place, and we'd go look at that place, and we went over that concrete pair quad was, and we decided that would be the best place, because it said you can get up here, and you'll be above everybody. No matter how many people are down here, you won't have anybody blocking your view. She had vertigo, though. If he got up there, he'd get dizzy. So he said, you'll have to stand behind me and hold on to me. I said, it's no problem at all. So we both got up there, and I stood behind him, and I held on to him. Mm -hmm. When they started to make their first turn, turning into the street, and he says, OK, here we go, or something to that effect. Zapruder never took his eye from the viewfinder as he shot the film. 
As the horrifying news of the shooting traveled through the streets, a stunned Zapruder began walking to his office. As he was leaving Dealey Plaza, he ran into Harry McCormick, a reporter for the Dallas Morning News, and told him about the film. McCormick arranged to meet back in Zapruder's office, but first, he wanted to find Forrest Sorrells, an agent he knew from the Dallas Secret Service field office, to inform him of the film. Zapruder's partner, Erwin Schwartz, recalls when he first heard of the film. And I went with another friend that lived pretty close to there to go to his house to turn on a television. And that, that was when I heard Walter Cronkite say the president is dead. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. And I picked up the phone and I called the office and I hear screaming and turmoil. And I said to the girl, I said, Mildred, what's going on? She said, oh, Mr. Schwartz, the police are here with shotguns. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, oh, Mr. Z has the films and they want the films and he told me to put it in the safe. I said, are they in the safe? And she said, yes, sir. I said, lock it. Where's Mr. Z? She says, he's in his office crying. And uh, she went and got him, and, and he picked up the phone, <clears throat> and he said, Erwin, Erwin, it was terrible. I saw his head come off. I say, I'll be right there. When McCormick arrived at Zapruder's office with Secret Service agent Sorrells, the men accompanied Zapruder and his partner to have the film processed. So I went and I opened the safe, and I got the camera. The film was still in the camera, and we took it uh, downstairs, and he told the uniforms, the two uniform cops, you have a car? And they said, yes, sir. And he said, let's go. McCormick believed the film could be developed at the Dallas Morning News, so the men went there. Finding no motion picture processing at the newspaper, they walked next door to the paper's television station, WFAA. Hearing of the eyewitness in their studios, producers at the station put Zapruder on the air and interviewed him on live TV. A gentleman just walked in our studio that I am meeting for the first time as well as you. This is WFA TV in Dallas, Texas. May I have your name, please, sir? My name is Abraham Zapruder. Mr. Zapruder? Zapruder, yes, sir. Zapruder. And would you tell us your story, please, sir? I got out in, uh, about a half hour earlier and get this a good spot to shoot some pictures. And I found a spot, one of these uh, concrete blocks that I have down near that park near the underpass. And I got on top there, there was another girl from my office, she was right behind me. <clears throat> and as I was shooting, as the president was coming down from Houston Street making his turn, it was about halfway down there, I had a shot. And he slumped to the side, like this. Then I had another shot or two, I couldn't say what it was, one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything, and I kept on shooting. That's about all. I'm just sick. I can't. I think that pretty well expresses the yeah. entire feelings of the whole world. Terrible. You have the film in your camera. We'll try yes, to get, I brought it on the studio. And, uh, we'll try to get that processed and have it as soon as possible. In the meantime, McCormick discovered that only Kodak could develop the film. He made arrangements with their processing plant in Dallas to do it. When the men arrived at Kodak, Sorrells received a phone call and was ordered to return to downtown Dallas. A suspect in the assassination, named Lee Harvey Oswald, had been detained. Another onlooker in Dealey Plaza, Phil Willis, had taken slides at the time of the assassination. He too was at the Kodak plant having the slides processed. Before Sorrells left the plant, he arranged to receive copies of the Willis slides as well. Harry McCormick stayed with us. And uh, sure enough, uh, the fellow said they're ready to be seen, and we went into a viewing room. While there are conflicting stories about what day the film was shown, it is certain that the Zapruder film was first screened in the projection room at the Kodak plant. Phil Chamberlain, who was production supervisor, recalls the first showing. So when that film came off the processing machine, Mr. Zapruder was there, and he and I and quite a group of our people probably about 15 in all, 
went in the projection room to see what he had on his film. Uh, and he started out, uh, as we were threading it up, apologizing that he really didn't know what was on the rest of the film, uh, that he re wasn't much of a photographer. Then Zapruder's film came on, and uh, number one, it was needle sharp, two, the color was beautiful, the focus was locked in perfect. The well, film was only, I believe, 22 seconds long, and, and that last shot you see his head come off. And I mean, you could see it so clear. I, 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 I've seen all these replicas and all the copies, nothing like that first one. All during the, the sequence of pictures of the movies, there's not a sound, not a sound except the projector. And when the projector was turned off, it had to have been three, four or five seconds like this, nothing, when one voice said, my God. Upon seeing the film, the Secret Service immediately asked for copies. The Kodak man said, you'll have to take it to Jameson. I'd never even heard of Jameson. He told us where it was. I, I think he called him, but I'm not sure. Even under these high pressure circumstances, mere hours after he witnessed the president's murder and with the Secret Service tracking his every move, Zapruder had the wherewithal to obtain affidavits from Kodak and the Jameson Laboratory stating the specific work they did. The first affidavit signed by Phil Chamberlain shows the work for the processing of the original film. And Zapruder and the Jameson people signed the agreements that there wouldn't be more than three copies made and uh, they made the three copies. And we had to take those copies to Kodak to get them developed. After the duplicates were processed at Kodak, Zapruder and Schwartz drove to a downtown police station. On Friday evening, November 22nd, Zapruder gave two of the three copies of his film to the Secret Service. By that time, Air Force One containing the body of the slain president and the newly sworn in president, Lyndon B. Johnson, had already landed in Washington, D.C. Once the news community heard of the Zapruder film, they clamored for the rights to it. Life magazine was especially fervent in its desire to get the film. Richard Stolley, the Pacific Coast editor for Life, flew into Dallas the afternoon of the assassination. In an interview before a live audience, Stolley recalls his weekend in Dallas. And I went into the Adolphus Hotel to set up a, uh, an office. And I'd been there about an hour or two, and I got a phone call from one of your distinguished uh, Patsy Swank. She had gotten word from a colleague that a local businessman had photographed the assassination from beginning to end with an eight millimeter home movie camera and she phonetically, she pronounced his name. And I picked up the Dallas phone book and ran my finger down the Z's and there it was, Zapruder, comma, Abraham. I called him, no answer. I called every 15 minutes for the next five hours and at about 11 o'clock this weary voice answered. I said, is this Mr. Zapruder? Yes. I identified myself. I said, is it true that you photographed the assassination? Yes. Have you seen the film? Yes. Did you get it from beginning to end? Yes. Can I come out and see it? No. Zapruder told Stolley to meet him at the office at 9 o'clock the next morning. Stolley was waiting there at 8. And he looked, he looked a slightly annoyed, but... Um, when I came in, but he said, well, you might as well come in and see this, because he invited the Secret Service at 8 o'clock. So it was a little room. Uh, he had this ancient 8 millimeter projector. This is tiny film. There's no sound. The only sound was this creaky projector. Meanwhile, other press are beginning to gather outside. Mr. Spruder says, um, Mr. Stolle was the first reporter to contact me so I'm going to talk to him first. The rest of the press went ballistic. 
promise us you won't sign anything. You've got to talk to us before. Promise, promise, and, and they were acting badly. So we sat down, and I said to her, <coughs> I said, Mrs. Spruder, um, when life uh, occasionally encounters pictures of uh, more than normal interest, that we um, will pay more than our normal space rates. I'm trying to be as casual as hell about all this. And, and I said, now, for instance, that piece of film we just saw, I said, you know, we might pay as much as $5,000 for that. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives, he gives me this kind of quizzical look and then grins. The whole point of that was to find out, did he know? And yes, he knew. So we just went up by increments, little by little. I got to $50,000 and I said, Mr. Spruder, this is truly as high as I can go without calling New York for, uh, for authorization to go higher. He looked at me for a few minutes and, or a few seconds and said, Let's do it. By noon on Saturday, less than 24 hours after the assassination, Life magazine had bought the print rights from Zapruder for two payments of $25,000. Stolle received the camera original and the last copy of the film. To avoid other reporters clamoring to buy the rights, Stolle left through a back exit. By Saturday evening, the 23rd of November, Zapruder's film was at Life's printing plant in Chicago. We carry the film to Chicago because the editorial, uh, the editorial site had moved to Chicago, which is where we printed the magazine then, um, and they were holding the magazine open. We threw out 300,000 covers. They stopped. The, as soon as we heard uh, of, of the assassination, they stopped printing the magazine, threw, the, threw all but a few stories out in the back, threw the cover out and began, and then we began putting together. Part of it was the history, Part of it was the reaction around the world, and, and the current story was what was happening in Washington and down here. So this film went up to uh, the, an editor in Chicago, and they printed, oh, a dozen or more frames in black and white. They couldn't do it in color at that point. While the original film was in Chicago, a copy was sent to New York. Sometime on Sunday, the publisher of Life magazine, C.D. Jackson, saw the 26-second film. Jackson decided the American public was not ready for such graphic images of the president's death and instructed Stolle to buy the motion picture rights to the film as well. I called him on Sunday evening and I said I'd like to come back and see him about um, getting the additional rights. I have to say he seemed relieved. On Monday morning, Stolle met with Zapruder and his attorney, Sam Passman. We sat there, it couldn't have taken more than uh, 15 minutes. I knew, again, where I could go. Uh, it was another 100,000. It was a total of $150,000 for all rights. By the time of JFK's funeral on Monday, November 24th, Time Incorporated owned all rights to the Zapruder film. In its November 29th issue, the magazine published black and white frames from the film. In the following issue, color frames were published. A week after the shooting in Dallas, President Johnson created a special commission to investigate Kennedy's assassination. Known as the Warren Commission, after Commission Chairman Chief Justice Earl Warren, the group of former and then government officials were to oversee the investigation and give their stamp of approval to the conclusions. During the investigation, the Zapruder film was examined closely by the commission staff, but the print they used was a second generation copy made by the FBI from one of the Secret Service copies. Some of the investigators wanted to look at a better copy and requested that the original film be borrowed from Time Incorporated. A representative from Life's photographic lab brought the film to Washington and projected it a few times for the investigators. 35 millimeter slides were made of some of the frames. When the commission published its findings, 
One volume contained black and white stills made from the Zapruder slides provided by Life. Researchers looking at these reproductions noticed that some of the frames were missing and that splices were clearly evident. Critics of the Warren Commission suspected a cover-up, claiming the missing frames revealed something conspiratorial. In 1967, Life magazine offered an explanation. Photolab technicians damaged the film when making copies and reproducing still frames. Specifics on how or when the accidents occurred were never given. In 1969, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison indicted a local businessman, Clay Shaw, for conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. During the trial, Garrison subpoenaed the Zapruder film from Time Incorporated, using the conclusions drawn from the film as evidence of conspiracy. Abraham Zapruder was called as a prosecution witness to verify that the film Garrison received from life was indeed the film Zapruder took the day of the assassination. On February 13, 1969, in a packed courtroom, Zapruder's film was shown in public for the first time. By the end of the trial, it had been shown nine more times. With the film in his possession, Garrison made sure duplicates were made. A conspiracy believer, Garrison wanted the bootleg copies to be distributed to colleges and universities across the country. After seeing the film, he believed the students would demand the assassination investigation be reopened. One of these bootleg copies was the centerpiece of a presentation called who killed JFK that traveled across the country in the mid-70s. Zapruder never saw the widespread public reaction to his film. He died in Dallas on August 30, 1970, of cancer. <laughs>